and working with her on our diversity, racial equity, and inclusion work. And here she is. Welcome, Yi. Well, good morning. Good morning. I can't seem to do two things at one time. I was responding to one of the questions in the chat. Very excited to be here this morning and just to unpack um, the content for today. Thank you so much for the introduction, Patricia. And uh, WICSAP is one of my favorite organizations to partner with alongside this journey of dismantling um, oppression and the many forms of racism. And so I want to, let me make sure I've got the screen share up. Let's see, bring up the presentation. So it looks like we have some great attendance today. It's Wednesday. We're almost through the week. There's good weather coming. It's a little cold out here in Federal Way, so I'm not sure where everybody else is sitting. Uh, and I'm also used to really engaging with people, so I understand the way that this is set up. Um, I don't know if the chat is open for folks, um, but I will do my best to peek in on it as we go through the content. Feel free to ask questions along the way if you have that capability, more than happy to respond to it. So there will be some reflective questions that we'll get into um, throughout the content. But today we're gonna um, talk about socialized gatekeeping, a historical practice. And part of the historical uh, practice piece is really looking at some key, um, what I call legislation that we don't even think about. And this is why we're gonna unpack how we're socialized around gatekeeping as a practice. Um, with the content. And so with that, I'm going to jump right in. If you um, are having any difficulties hearing me, just let me know. I've got assigned this something going on uh, due to all of this pollen um, where I'm at. So we always get started with um, the land acknowledgement. It's so critical to this work. And I think I'm gonna punt it back to my friend and colleague, Patricia, to uh, start it off. And then I'll take the last part of it. Oh, ye, I already read it. I'm sorry while we were waiting for you. Okay. I went ahead and read it. So you can go ahead and go for it. Okay. Well, if we've done the people, have we, you, have, did you do the people acknowledgement? The land acknowledgement. No, go, oh, go the for land. It. Okay. Go for it. So with the the uh, people with the land acknowledgement, so critical because it's really kind of the the historical context for which we do all of the anti oppression work in the United States. And there's always the one or two people when I engage with teams. It kind of tells me where folks are at on the continuum. It's not a good or a bad thing. It's just a thing. Uh, when I say in the United States, they say, I'm sorry, when I say in America, they say, oh, is that North America or South America? <laughs> it's like, okay, let me qualify that a little bit more. Um, we're talking about in the historical context of the United States, but it's also a myth that colonization wasn't happening in other places around the globe as well. So we know that not to be true. Uh, what we do know also to be true is that, um, and we acknowledge that in the United States as well, is that you know there were enslaved Africans brought to this stolen land against their will and exploited labor to work the crop fields um, and build structures um, that they were denied access to enter. And some of those very structures who we pay you know, homage to, do to today um, at the Capitol, right, to United States Capitol. And so, and really just everywhere in the South, you could see there's been movements around taking down some of these statues that represent um, white supremacy um, founders um, in this nation. So we've seen some of that. So when I participate in the land acknowledgement, I always like to invite people to kind of think about how did we get here today? In the African tradition, um, it's called Sankofa, that you look back just enough to get the information that you need to move forward, because uh, it's the move forward piece that is the healing piece for us um, as we engage in this work. 
uh, one of my favorite quotes, as many of them, um, Dr. Maya Angelou, um, I've learned that I still have a lot to learn. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's so true. It's so true in this work. It's one of the reasons why I don't um, give in to like guru or expert, just because I'm learning every day. I get the, you know, just the, the blessing to engage with people that at different places on the continuum that um, I get to learn from. And then even new people like my grandbaby that teaches me every day, you know, so that's the pride of my life today. Not the mother, the grandbaby, right? Just, I like to acknowledge that. Uh, today, we're gonna really talk about, you know, the goal is a foundational understanding of the gatekeeping process, its key components and the many ways the machine works to secure those that are gated in and gated out of opportunity. And I'm gonna unpack these terms because shared learning is so important and shared terminology as we go forward with the content. Um, one immediate key term um, is how we're defining racism. Lots of definitions out there, all of them are equally good, but for the purposes of this presentation, I've adopted the one from the People's Institute from Survival and Beyond, um, one of the more um, popular containers that they use is undoing institutional racism. Um, and so uh, racial prejudice, plus institutional power equals racism. So the person that has both racial prejudice and institutional power, according to this definition, is defined as a racist. And so to not get into debate of what that really looks like, because anybody can have bias or racial prejudice, um, but everyone doesn't have institutional power. You may have nexus to institutional power until things go down. And then you really are reminded you know, where you're really at in the pyramid of social dominance. So for the purposes of this, try to hold this kind of in perspective that this will be our operating definition as we talk about gatekeeping. Um, with uh, that definition, um, there's, a, you know, a couple of terms that it, we talk about quite a bit. And as you begin to engage more in this work, um, the work is around how we are going back and forth with internalized racial oppression. Um, and it helps us really put into context some of the words and the jargon on the screen. There was a time where we couldn't name the trauma. We didn't understand what was happening. Um, in organizational development, they call it a disorienting dilemma because we've been socialized to live one way. Um, and then we find out that um, it's not true. And I'll give you an example just right off the top, that if you work hard enough, if you work hard enough, you can achieve the American dream. Um, and so there's a lot of things with that kind of statement. One, um, the American dream might mean a house, a dog, two kids, you know, maybe two and a half kids, <laughs> the white picket fence, you know, um, and things of that nature. But is that really success, right? We work our whole lives to get to a place where we can enjoy it. And some of us don't make it because we've worked so hard and our health doesn't allow us to, right? And so when we begin to think about what did we give up in exchange for. And the way that we have given it up is really through this idea of internalized racial oppression. And we're all on both sides at different points in our life. So I'll start with the inferiority, right? It's really boils down to a negative self image, but this negative self image was not, we weren't born this way, first and foremost, right? This is a, an image that uh, was given to us that we had to buy into. And it wasn't given to us in our first generation. It was given to us multiple generations ago. It was internalized and it was passed down through generation. And so in our communities, we're reminded of this self image. And what it does is hold us in this box, in this place of limitation. Um, it's a message around the collective. It's a message around a uh, group identity. And then what it does, is it beholds us to a certain pattern of negative behavior and limitation. When we look at internalized racial oppression, the superiority part, it's unearned positive self-image um, based on um, 
a lot of ideas, but the main one is on being white. Um, and I say it on being white because they're really race is a social construct. And so none of us are black, none of us are white, none of us are anything, but the social construct that was developed primarily for uh, financial purposes um, in 1691 um, to make sure that um, those that were here get out of a contract they had with indigenous servants um, at the time. And so in Virginia is where they first began to codify the word white to describe European set settlers, is for lack of a better word, um, that came to uh, the United States of America. And then it began to kind of solidify certain privileges like land ownership, um, voting under the Articles of Confederations, and all those things before the Constitution. And so these are like historical facts. So you can always Google it, uh, like we do everything. We're, in, we're a Google nation, right? Just Google it. I'm not making it up, right? So the, these are the kind of things. So when we go back and forth between internalized racial oppression and inferiority, uh, we can get analysis paralysis. So what I mean by this is that, let's say you've been socialized around inferiority, you are able to attain a college degree, there's an opportunity that you want uh, within the workplace. This negative self image of yourself may put pressure on you to give up part of your identity um, and part of your culture to attain that. And we'll talk a little bit about that a little more, a little later in the presentation. Uh, whereas with superiority, getting a degree may not be, uh, be the path for you, but you still would have access to that opportunity that might be, let's say a leadership role or a high paying position within an organization that you believe you deserve, right? And so it's not even a second thought. Everybody has fears, right? Like Marian Williamson, um, the author talks about our greatest fears that not our failure, but our success. Um, folks from the inferiority side of internalized racial oppression are less likely to go out uh, on a limb for those opportunities or to speak up for justices or you know, in the workplace and things like this. So we're constantly going back and forth, even if we're feeling like we're qualified for something based on the checklist that's constantly moving, <laughs> uh, we'll talk ourselves out of it because we've been socialized to do that. So that's just one idea of like how it shows up for us. When we talk about, when I talk about socialization, I'm talking from a sociology perspective. And this term really describes the process of internalizing those norms. And so those norms that I just talked about with internalized oppression, whether it's inferiority or superiority, um, these are the things that, again, we pass the virtues down through the generations. Um, and part of that looks like gatekeeping. Gatekeeping, you know, when we talk about uh, socialization with it, it's always the learning and the teaching and it goes in a cycle. We're learning and we're teaching. And part of things that we learn is where the boundaries are, where the limitations are, right? Um, kind of when we're operating from scarcity, which is the inferiority, and we don't have examples that look like us that have succeeded. When we see the folks like the Oprahs and the Michael Jordans, they're considered the exception, right? Um, and, and we have many examples. If we were in a more inclusive society uh, where equity was present, what they're doing wouldn't be special because we would know everyone has access to be able to have that opportunity. But even in that, someone had to open a gate for them to get that opportunity. And this is why we're gonna be talking about gatekeeping uh, this morning. So we're always doing the learning and teaching. The learning and teaching is either reinforcing inferiority or it's reinforcing superiority. And if I'm going too fast, please just let me know and I can slow down because I can talk. If there's nothing else I don't know how to do, I can talk. <laughs> so in gatekeeping, so this is um, something else that comes from Kareen um, Barzilia uh, Nahan uh, from her work in 2007. Um, around gatekeeping. And there's a couple of things that we'll unpack inside of this. So when we're talking about who is the gatekeeper, we often generalize um, certain things when we talk about oppression. For example, 
the man, we give, you know, these little cute names to it as if there's one man like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain pulling levers, uh, which there's not, right? Or we say government as if it's a person, um, but it's actually an entity. And the entity can be a combination of people, organizations, or government, right? And not necessarily in that order, but the people are inside organizations, the people are inside government, and the people are making decisions at every level of the organization. You don't have to have formal leadership authority and decision-making on this grand scale to make decisions because there are gatekeepers everywhere from the moment you walk into the facility and right now, COVID is the thing that folks are using to gatekeep as well, right? So I think about, uh, I have a niece who's getting ready to have her very first child and her husband is not allowed to go with her to doctor's appointments because you know we're being socialized around there's a risk to have one other person in the doctor's visit and the opportunity cost is that he has to join, you know, by FaceTime or he gets to miss out of the process of, you know, the child being born until the day of the birth. I was told by one of the nurses when I accompanied my son to the doctor that if you just advocate, they will let you in. So it's clearly just not a safety thing, but it's one of the things that we're being socialized around. However, you can have six people in a restaurant eat together, but you can't have a couple go to a doctor visit for a most important moment that they can't get back. So it's just things that you begin to think about a little bit differently. Uh, when we talk about the gated here in this presentation, when I talk about it, it's really the entity kept in or out of access, opportunity, information. And again, more unpacking to do as we go through the presentation, but there's the gatekeeper and the gated, right? And all of this works within kind of this machine of oppression, um, the mechanism of oppression we're ready to talk about and some of the key components of it, just to help ground it, you know, this kind of idea and this framework that we're talking about. At some point in our lives and even today, we're gatekeepers, even when we think how far we may be, how far we've come on the continuum of becoming anti-racist. So structural gatekeeping. This is the process by which we control access to information, resources, and opportunities. What does this really look like in action? Um, it's how we, you know, using that definition, move through a gate. Uh, there's not a real physical gate there, but sometimes it can be. One example of that would be the families that are at the border right now, right? There's a narrative that we have to adopt that, that makes that okay. I found a clip recently, which is so ironic of President Reagan and um, I think it was, George Bush as the vice president talking about how outrageous it is, the immigration policies and reform, and that we have to really center people and not get into a situation where we'll be rounding up people uh, like the Japanese internment camps. And yet, and still we've done that. So I've decided in this presentation to, to kind of use immigration as one of the key pieces of legislation when we talk about the gated. Um, now, this may be intentional in some cases, because we saw that uh, Trump ran on that platform of fear with folks. So there's a narrative you have to tell people to make them feel comfortable with keeping the gate closed. Or it may be um, unintentional because we've just never questioned it and we've just accepted it as true, right? When we talk, when I talk about the mechanisms of gatekeeping, so the key points here in the mechanism is access, equity, power and control, per preservation, and opportunity. And it's really talking about the means used to carry out gatekeeping. And so it's whether we're denying access, whether we're operating from a place of inequity or advocating for equity, um, sharing power and control or preserving power and control or withholding power and control, uh, preservation um, or dismantling, 
and then providing opportunity or withholding opportunity, right? It just depends on whomever the gatekeeper might be. I see something in the chat, so let me see. Okay. Some of the consequences of gatekeeping, right? And so for some folks, um, especially my WhatsApp family um, who've seen it, some of this information might not be new, but we're gonna um, unpack it. I just wanna level set with everyone. So when we talk about consequences of gatekeeping, just like with uh, racism, right? There's some three levels, uh, three levels of consequences, oppression, oppression by force, and oppression by deprivation. So when we talk about oppression in general, it's really exploitation and abuse of power over another person or groups of people. Um, when we talk about oppression by force, it's really kind of that coercive nation, uh, na um, the co or co coercion, I can't get it out. See, it's too early for me. I normally don't even get up before 10 o'clock, but um, duress, or the act of imposing an object, label, role, experience, or set of living conditions that is unwanted or is um, it detracts from well being, right? If I'm stressed out about how I'm going to get my next meal or keep my shelter, right? Um, I'm not thinking rationally. So I'll do anything. I'm in a state of, um, desperation to provide for my family. So when we think about the ways that we've been socialized is that all of us don't have that basic need or desire to provide for our families. This is one narrative that we've been told, right? And we could see that dating back again to the Reagan administration with this idea of welfare mothers, right? Without naming, it brings an image up to mind and people adopt that image. When uh, President Obama was trying to pass um, affordable health care, dubbed as uh, Obamacare, there were some folks, um, low income folks, using Medicare, benefiting from Medicare, getting surgery that was being interviewed, who was against it. And they didn't have the means to personally cover their surgery and didn't have insurance outside of government provided insurance. Right. And so when we kind of think about that, here's a set of living conditions that you're in, you're not happy with, you're benefiting from um, this legislation that he's wanting for a type a universal type health care. But because of your own racial prejudice and who it's coming from, you're adamantly against it because of how you've been socialized. Right. So you want to keep, keep the gate closed after you get your surgery. So we just want to think about that, you know, by force. Um, and then the deprivation piece of oppression, right? So blocking or taking away a role, desired experience, or a set of living conditions, or even family. We see this quite a bit in Pierce County. Um, families, BIPOC families are 60% more likely to have their children taken by child protective services. I don't know if anybody followed, but there was an article recently that came out about this Dr. Woods um, at Tacoma General and Mary Bridge Hospital. She was a certified uh, child abuse specialist. And that's a whole other story that I could tell, but um, she had been responsible for separating these children from their mother and come to find out she wasn't even certified as a child abuse specialist. Um, she was a doctor, but she wasn't certified. Um, and I just always felt like, who checked that? And it, you know, when it came out, because we had a situation, me and my daughter, where we challenged some of that decision-making. But when we think about oppression by deprivation, one of the things that comes up is do what we say we're gonna do. And she was trying to pressure my daughter to come back and subject my grandbaby to a lot of radiation because she was learning to walk and braced herself and the doctor, in the ER thought she had bilateral wrist fractures only to find out she did not. It was shadows on the x-ray. And so we just kind of think about how those things began to play out. So again, a lot of terminology, we want to kind of take some notes on this and hold this as we continue to go through the presentation because there is a lot of content we're gonna cover. 
when we look at um, the types of oppressions a little bit closer, uh, there's primary, secondary, and tertiary, right? So the primary, you know, oppression is blatant variety, directly perpetrated, you know, either um, through one of the modalities that's listed he, um, here or both of the modalities, uh, force or deprivation that was on the previous slide. So the secondary oppression doesn't actively participate in oppression, but benefits from the oppression. It's like, oh, I don't really see what's happening. Um, I, I'm not really causing it. And, and we see this when you begin to do racial equity or anti-racist uh, work. You know, one of the things that Trump did, you know, which was abuse of power, is that decided that, hey, if you're providing um, DEI training or anti-racial training, it makes white people feel bad. So uh, you can't use federal funds to do it. I don't know if folks remember that. And so then that, again, wasted energy to get people to strategize about other ways to fund uh, racial equity work. When we look at the tertiary oppression, right? This is where, you know, folks are like, hey, I've seen the examples of people in the workplace who are advocates, who are working towards equity, either they've been marginalized or had the gate shut on them, what we say, and I have to examine this terminology around blackballed, they're the troublemakers, I don't want to be in that category, so I seek to become part of the dominant group, and I'm willing to sell out or abandon my own group identity. Um, and part of the way I do that is to defend the actions or values of oppression um, at the expense of those who are the target of oppression, right? And we call this cognitive dissonance. I know one of the more familiar stories that someone shared with me from undoing institutional racism in the training was going to um, Africa and there was a church <clears throat> where they held services on top and underneath was the holding cell, if you will, for enslaved Africans um, that were being prepped to be shipped. And so while they're up <laughs> at the top, you know, praying, if you will, you can hear the beating and the trauma below and no one stops. And it's just like, when you see that, right, that's the cognitive dissonance where we're kind of, I'm colorblind, I don't see what's happening or what have you, or you're, you know, guarding the gate that no, this is not what's real. We have really important reasons why some people or criteria qualify to come in the gate and, and qualify to stay out of the gate. There's a certain standard that we're trying to keep in place. And it's why in hiring processes, words like fit are no longer relevant because you're never trying to maintain a status quo. You know, innovation doesn't come from everybody that's the same, right? Effective business planning doesn't come from everybody having the same idea. It comes from diversity of thought. It comes from varied lived experiences of people bringing that in and helping you to examine. There's a really great story around Kennedy um, and even Bill Clinton um, trying to um, do a couple of things. One with the Cuban Missile Crisis um, under Kennedy and him really looking to his cabinet to inform, but they said what they thought he wanted to hear versus what he needed to hear. And it was disastrous, okay? Um, and so we see a lot of that, you know, those types of examples of folks that not having the courage or feeling like if I don't say anything, even though it's taken place, I'm not responsible for the impact which is not true. You know, there's a, a book, several books, Audre Lorde has one of them is that, you know, your, sil your silence won't protect you. You're still complicit if you're silent, right? So you, you do have to, you know, be clear about what side you're on in humanity here. So we have a couple of choices when we think about kind of the levels, the types of oppression, we think about uh, the various um, definitions of oppression and even in the structural gatekeeping. So I didn't find a nice picture of a gate, but I love these pictures of the door, you know, and red is my favorite color. If you haven't figured that out by now, um, I normally wear a whole lot of red. <laughs> um, I've always liked it even as a little kid. Um, but, you know, when we're thinking about, you know, these choices with uh, gatekeeping um, or 
information keeping, we want to think about the first thing. The narrative has to be developed to keep convincing us um, around when to close and open the gate. Okay. So here are some of the things that we've been socialized around. And maybe you've heard a few of these. Maybe you've said a few of them, right? Oh, the gate is broken and it won't open or close. And, you know, somebody has to come out and fix it. So um, I'm not really responsible. Oh, it's out of my control. Well, the policy states, um, when people begin to quote policy to me, I just look at them because I didn't ask for a policy lesson. You know, I came for a specific thing. Um, and you can really tell when I really have reached a level of what I call pissativity, because I even lower my voice. You know, some people raise their voice. I get really clear with people at that point, uh, because at this point, I know that you're not really engaging with me because you're not really wanting to listen to problem solve you're listening to quote policy to me, right? And I always feel like if you're in a position and you don't like your job, you shouldn't be in a job where you're meant to help people, right? Because it's a disservice. Um, oh, that decision is above my pay grade or need a supervisor approval for me to do that. It's always been that way. So we can't change that. And when you ask the question, well, why, why can't you change? Well, I don't know why we can't change it. We just haven't changed, it's always that way. So we have to adopt these narratives to the gate only opens at this time or closes at this time. Or that the data suggests, real dear friend of, my, friend of mine was talking to this researcher who was about 75 years old um, over on the East Coast. And one of the things that she shared with me is he was saying, you know, I've been doing this job for 50 something years. And one of the, my biggest learning in my career has been how much researchers control the data, right? They're supposed to be objective, but they realize there is a power that they hold by how they craft the data to tell a story. And that data is used as evidence best practices or evidence-based best practices to make a decision. And we've adopted that, that that's the only way that we can make decisions. So we drive people to get that kind of data. When we do racial equity work, one of the things that as a racial equity consultant that we try to do is get the qualitative, the lived experience, the voices of the people. That's why stakeholder and community engagement is so important because we can't just rely on data points. It tells part of the story, not the whole story. Um, a great example is there's legislation that passed recently, sorry, uh, Washington State Constitution decision around uh, Blake, United States versus Blake, and it has to do with possession of illegal substances. And one of the things that has kind of come up in this is that how are states and local municipalities going to respond with um, kind of what the data suggests? Uh, which is that one, there's not enough time to prosecute certain cases because resources are being on one case and that to address folks with substance use disorder, that money's gonna be funneled in some of the community-based organizations that are providers. Well, what we know is there's not enough providers. This is what we know. That's what the data tells us. Um, we have the resources to be able to create more providers, but that takes time. So we keep investing in the same models because we have those fancy words from researchers that it's evidence-based. We know that 21-day programs, 30-day programs are not long enough. They need long-term care programs. We have legislation that says family members can have someone involuntary committed when it's their harm to themselves and others, uh, when it's mental health, but when it's substance use, that's not exercise, even though there's legislation on the book, right? So then you have to ask yourself about what is the narrative that has been developed about how we want to address these issues, right? And we can talk through all of the impact areas in life. These are just some of the ones that I'm involved in. Um, and so I you know, was engaged with one of the community meetings and I had to ask the Senator, is that do you have you know, lived experience with trying to navigate these systems? Because what you're saying, we're invested in, thus be clear, 
it's not tax, it's not um, government dollars, it's taxpayer dollars. See, if we don't put that in perspective, we feel like they're doing us a favor, they serve the people. But we're, we don't feel our power all the time. So we're kind of beholden to those positions that we elect. Um, but when you begin to understand your power, then you begin to question how you're complicit or not with keeping the gate open or closed and demand that gates come down, period, right? Um, I'm not in control of the gate. Somebody else is. We get to deflect. Um, it's, you know, part of the narrative is it's goodwill for some and that everyone is not deserving. I worked hard to get where I, where I'm at. My grandparents were immigrants. Um, they worked hard. They came with $10 in their pocket, um, and they were able to make it. Why can't everybody else? Right. Or that, you know, there are folks that receive welfare or TANF benefits or EBT that just don't want more. Um, we don't take into consideration the mental health state that folks are in, right? The depression that goes along with it for multiple generations. And what we know now, you know, through science is that it changes the sperm and the DNA and, and we can pass that through to each generation, kind of that state. Um, and then kind of one of the last one is that we do this, we control this gate in the name of protecting democracy, fiscal responsibility and or <laughs> protection against fraud. In a lot of the um, images that I've seen of Africa, I don't know about you growing up, always had to do with the Somalian children, especially the feed the children commercial. It's always the little kids with no clothes on with the fly on the eye. And so my whole view of what Africa looks like is limited to poverty. And that, you know, the country is so poor that they don't have resources. And so then you have to ask yourself, if they're so poor, then why are they taking diamonds from over there? If they're so poor, why are they taking gold from over there, right? And you begin to look at all of the resources that actually have been raped in the art. And even recently, I think it was in France, um, discovered that, and I don't think it was a real discovery like Columbus discovered America, right? But it was like, you know, we have all of this African art. And um, I was in a debate with a friend of mine that um, they're like, we would give it back to Africa, but they don't really know how to take care of the art. They don't really have a place to put their art that we stole from them hundreds of years ago. So we're just gonna keep it over here and just acknowledge that we have it, right? So we're gonna, you know, protection against fraud, by, but our goodwill is just acknowledging that we have it and that becomes, you know, sufficient enough. And, you know, but then the standard of how art is kept, who makes that decision, right? Who knows best? And so it's those kind of things that we talk about the socialized narrative of gatekeeping. Uh, types of gatekeepers is uh, where we're going to go next here. I should pause. Any questions? Because so far, I think I'm just knocking it out of the park. And, you know, people will be like, what is she talking about? <laughs> I can only see a few people at a time, but it's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Teresa. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. <laughs> uh, so types of gatekeeper. Now the list is exhaustive. And I think in the foundational training that I deliver, we actually go over, there's a handout and there's about nine or 10 on the list. But I picked two of the ones that are kind of most prevalent. Um, that could be seen as positive, and two of the ones that we bump up against kind of when we're doing this work. So I wanted to start with the curator, right? So with the curator, right, they're providing of um, preventing access to a service status or a position. We might see them in hiring processes, uh, you know, my HR background always makes me pick on recruitment. We might see this to um, customer service person 
who knows that there's another pot of money maybe to access medical services or rent services for folks, um, but they're just not willing to uh, provide it. Uh, for folks that are in need because of maybe the color of a person's skin, a person's varying ability, or we, we, we see it where um, there was a couple, same-sex couple, where the, who was the lady? I think she was in Texas or the Carolina wouldn't issue a marriage license because it was against her religious belief, right? And she felt, she was an elected official, I believe, and she felt like that was within her right to deny a service, right? Uh, uses uh, or uh, using kind of the cur curator also uses gatekeeping as a screening to in and out to of who decides, you know, um, who can have access to. It's also used to uh, control participation in something. Now, this is a hot button because we're seeing it in voting rights, right, in Georgia. That was just kind of a reaction to, you know, what Stacey a Abrams did, you know, door to door, door to door, door to door. People didn't think that that was gonna be effective. And it turns out that it got, you know, a black Senator elected in Georgia, right? And so we see the power of when people come together. Um, gateway stations are designed to attract attention of the gated. Oh, look, this is what I mean by the, look at how these people are acting, right? You know, they do studies, there's a very famous studies of, of aggressive or violent behavior that has been referenced many times throughout history. And you have to pay attention to where the study is conducted. The study is conducted in prison. Um, the, the study doesn't look at the trauma of the people you're seeing the symptoms of people who have gone through trauma. And I'm not saying have sympathy for people that are incarcerated, but I'm saying have some humanity. Because if you look at United States prison system, it may not be as, as, as terrible as some places, but it's also not as good as some places because our system doesn't focus on rehabilitation. It is truly about institutionalizing a person to become acclimated to being uh, less than, right? And it also serves as a way to control voting by stripping folks voting rights away for them. So we have to begin to think about it. And then in the last 15, 20 years, we begin to privatize prisons and probably longer than that, because this is just when we became aware of it. And so now it's big money, right? The curator, you know, type of gatekeeping is also about power, censorship, blocking and zoning. We saw that in redlining, okay, um, with good reasons, right? It's that Black people were moving into neighborhoods. So we adopt that narrative and for no apparent reason, just being Black brought the property value down. Now we could say, oh, that was so long ago. It's not relevant today. There's a lady who made a TikTok video. My Wixap family knows I love a good TikTok. I owe them a few. Um, her and her husband was refinancing their home, black woman, white man, beautiful baby. And they had an appraiser come out. They had family photos up of the couple and the house appraised for almost a hundred thousand dollars under market. So they had another appraiser come out because the bank questioned it. It was like, how, you know, how did we even finance this house in the first place? Um, and um, the house came in $100,000 over market um, and they were able to refinance. And so this story kind of went wildfire everywhere because at first the wife was excited that that made more sense, the second appraiser. Um, but then she became sad that, you know, just her mere color of her skin devalued her property. And we see, saw that in redlining, right? So again, some of these things around gatekeeping and when you have subjective decision-making, one person gets to decide, it's classic, right? So censorship me is the mechanism here. And, and again, we see this as example in government institutions um, with the power to do this and that, issuing permits, um, I was recently looking into getting um, a gun. One of the things you have to have is a, a license, a gun license, a permit. So the gatekeeping that's happening now is that as folks are trying to protect their families, their own well-being, everybody's buying a gun during COVID. 
And the appointments are two to three months out just to get fingerprinted. I was floored by that. I was like two to three months out. Everybody has the same idea. You know, everyone's feeling like the end of the world is here. So we, you know, <laughs> we gotta all get ready. So it's just really interesting, right? So again, when we see um, this type of gatekeeper with the censorship, um, it's in government institutions, but we also see it on Facebook, if you're a member of Facebook. And I know Mark Zuckerberg is listening to me now. I appreciate Apple because Apple goes up against the machine because their products are so expensive. They don't wanna lose that money, right? But they're not turning over their data. You're gonna, they're gonna take it all to the court and they have the money to do that. But, um, one of the things that you see on Facebook that they were called out about is hate groups and what they're describing as hate groups. That if it's a BIPOC group sharing information about things that are happening, they've began to censor them. But when there was like the Proud Boys, they didn't censor them, right? But that's one of the mechanisms. We began to kind of look at that. So let me see, I see some questions here. Um, hear more about what to do if you are in fact not in control so that you are just not passing the buck. That's a really great question, Michelle. Um, and then how to ask the right questions, let's see, how to ask the right questions to avoid being dismissed and kept in the dark about their particular job role in a nonprofit setting. I think I would wanna have a little more context there. Uh, so I think hear more about what to do if you're in fact not in control. I think I wanna know how we define uh, not in control because there are different points that we may not have formal authority, but we may have sash, uh, social capital. So I'm gonna put a pin and try to come back to that, um, that question. One of the things when you align the equity, I was putting together this code of commitment for another organization. It's just framing up all of the principles around doing this work. And one of the things that came up is that when you're committed to it, you have some community agreements of transparency, right? Oh, thank you for that context, Margaret. Yeah, my sister's on the case. She's like, we're going to get you a permit because <laughs> she already has her gun. Um, uh, when we look at this other type of gatekeeping, the protector, okay? So the protector is a very interesting type of gatekeeper, uh, regulating information coming from inside and its, in, in its distribution um, to protect members of the organization or the information itself. The mechanism is protection. And you see, we've talked about this if you've gone to any kind of equity training around protectionism. When George Floyd video first was released a year ago, um, on my Facebook feed, one, if we're Facebook friends, I'm checking your Facebook friends. I don't want to be your only Black Facebook friend, number one. <laughs> like, I, I can't, you, I don't want that responsibility. Um, and so a lot of my friends, we, we share a lot of values around humanity together. And it's explicit to me. People say, you know, you can disagree. We can't disagree around humanity. We can't disagree around oppressing anybody. We can't disagree around that. Um, if I feel like that's kind of your steep value, then we can't even, what are we talking about uh, at this point? When I think about protectionism, when people were outraged and emotional and didn't know how to respond to what they had witnessed, um, different than Philando Castile being murdered in front of his daughter, uh, and I ironically had a gun with the permit, and the first reaction was the threat of his skin. Um, and then when the city settled with his family, the one of the cops said, hey, the mother's probably gonna use it to buy more crack. Now there was no evidence she had a crack 
use habit or what have you, but it became a narrative that was adopted. So when I think about kind of that protection mechanism, it's statements like, we don't know the whole story. I have to see the whole video. Laquan McDonald's was a kid, 17 years old in Chicago, who was shot like some 30 something times and the police moved to cover it up. Emmanuel Rahm was then removed and replaced with um, a new mayor as a result of that. Um, and, and there was some intentional work done on behalf by the law enforcement to remove video and destroy evidence, not knowing there were video cameras at nearby restaurants across the street. So that became a whole other, other thing of the protection mechanism. So we see this in action with gatekeeping as well. Um, the protector also uses gatekeeping to manage confidentiality or integrity or of information flow throughout the organization, but also uh, from the organization. And we sanitize it so much that we don't even know what is the real version that should have happened or that should have went out because we're so afraid of retribution, right? We're not comfortable with that kind of conflict of being very genuine because we don't know how to sit in relationship with each other and work things out. Um, the protector also preserves core values, norms, and culture, right? And that's the person that, hmm, in an interview process, you know, this person has all the experience that we've asked for, but I can't quite see myself hanging with them after work. Or they just are missing that something I can't put my finger on. Well, the job announcement didn't say you need that something that I can put my finger on. Right. So we have to be really clear about, you know, what are we protecting status quo or do we want innovation? Do we want to move the organization forward? And when we want talented people to support us in doing that, we have to be open to um, people supporting us. So let's pause right here. So somebody wanted to um, ask a question. Michelle. You know, I can't do, I'm a grandmother now. I'm gonna keep saying that. I can't do two things at once. <laughs> yes, I've, un, I've uh, allowed Kendra to clarify her question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hello. Hello, Kendra. Hello. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, yes please go ahead. Hello. Oh, sorry. I have a court appearance here. Um, my question was just about, you know, like obviously nobody wants to be the one passing the buck when someone says, you know, this isn't right. And you're saying it's out of my control. Like, how do you, I don't know, address that situation? I guess maybe it's situation specific, but you know, I, I don't want to be the one doing that yet when you don't have control, what, what can you do? So that makes sense. <laughs> well, so, you know, what comes to mind for me is a customer service situation and I'm sure there's many of it. So I'll try to take it outside of the immediate workspace, but it is still somebody else's workspace. Right. And maybe there is a policy around uh, returns or, purchases or, or, or something. One way that you can help kind of open the gate and not keep the gate is help to brainstorm solutions. Even though the policy might say this, maybe you say, here's someone that you should talk to. You help them navigate through the gate um, to advocate for themselves, right? If you don't have that formal authority and you're not comfortable with um, at that point, and I've seen that happen quite a bit too, where, okay. And you do your due diligence to share it with the next level up. So if you're a manager, what you observe in the interaction, right? Um, feels like hmm, something's not quite right about this interaction because I, you know, I know that I've seen it done for someone else. And I'll give you an ex another example. I was at the um, urgent care this Saturday um, because I have this congestion. And the doctor, and see, and this is when you do this work, you see racism everywhere, number one. 
So sometimes I got to turn it off, but I'm already knowing that because of the skin that I'm in, that I'm expected to have a higher threshold of pain, right? So I'm less likely to get medicine that is considered pain medicine. And I don't want pain medicine um, or I'm less likely to be diagnosed accurately unless I advocate and ask all of the questions, including what's on Dr. Google and all, all these kind of things. But the doctor came in and he said to me, I was having some symptoms of numbing and I didn't know what it was. And the consultant nurse says, let's rule out everything. It could be a pinched nerve, uh, but it also sounds like it could be signs of a stroke, right? But let's, let's be sure. So I go to urgent care and the first thing the doctor was saying is that, well, you know, the neurological test that he's having me do seems you seem pretty strong or what have you. And I'm thinking I have to be strong. I can't fall to pieces. I'm not allowed to be vulnerable, <laughs> right? So, you know, so I do what you ask me to do because I'm socialized to be compliant. But I said to him, before I leave here, I want a CAT scan. Well, I don't want to subject you to that needless radiation. I said, needless radiation. This nurse told me these are potential warning signs of a stroke. So I would rather be safe than have my anxiety up, especially since I have examples of people that I know who went home after being turned away from urgent care or the hospital. And so then the nurse comes in afterwards and I said, is that weird that I had to ask for a CAT scan and be adamant? And her response was, I've seen this doctor order a CAT scan for people presenting with fewer symptoms than you. And I was blown away, but not surprised, right? And so that made me feel good about being able to use my voice. And then I have to ask myself a question. Okay, do I document this in a way where I write another letter to someone just to let them know that I see what's happening here and are you gonna address this collectively about this practice, right? So like in that example, I had to advocate. I checked with someone else there who affirmed for me that no, it's not in my head and you did the right thing. And if you felt that this is problematic, here's who you should be talking to. So something like that, is that helpful, Kendra? She's unmuted. Thank you. Though. Okay. And then there's another question here about being about pushing against uh, gatekeeping as a person of color in a primarily white institution. Yeah, there is, in my experience, there's not a safe way to do it. Um, and, and here's what, and I'm going to say that there are no safe spaces in America. Let me just say that. They're, they're, they're not. Um, there are spaces where you'll have partnership, but then you'll have partnership in numbers to challenge the fact that there are no safe spaces. And I call it skin in the game, right? Because I think people get dug in and the ego comes up. This is just what I've observed. Even if they agree with you, the fact that you they feel questioned they dig in and, and I had an experience at one of the theaters that was bringing in this um, director that had a past and was actually sued uh, for some racial slurs and just the temperament fostered in this particular theater. And this director wanted to co-direct with this person because of a personal relationship and was unwilling to see this past. And so when questioned by a lot of people, and they were all white before it reached me, um, and they you know, wanted a meeting to say, how do we approach this? Um, because this person is not listening. I had a conversation with both of the directors, the one that worked there and the one that uh, the director wanted to bring. And even in that, the director doubled down and would not see. And then, you know, and from my perspective, it's like, Unless you're serious about aligning to equity principles, I can't continue to work because this is a values judgment. And I think that we have to tap into our personal power. Every time I've done that and took a stand about what was right for humanity or what I believe was right for humanity, the universe has supported that. 
And so when I say, you know, the recommendations is you have to speak truth to power. And if you're uncomfortable speaking truth to power, get some advocates on your side, build some relationships within the organization, ask more questions than give answers. I ask people, did you think about this? What do you think about this situation? Is this just me? And sometimes it could just be you, but you're not wrong, even if it is you, because sometimes you've got the lived experience that you've seen it play out. Uh, one book that we just finished reading was the So You Want to Talk About Race. And one of the things that Ijima talks about if a person of color says it's about race, then it's about race. So just be assured in that. And you know, part of how we present is that we have to do our work and not be concerned about the word unprofessional because that's a Eurocentric standard. We have to not be concerned about being sassy, rude, or angry for that matter because that's still regulating how we get to show up and how we get to respond in situations. And other folks aren't regulated in that same way. People who identify as cisgender women are regulated in being emotional. But when a man cries, he oh, he's sensitive and it's acceptable on some regards. And then other times he's so sensitive that he's not considered a, you know, a man. And so we have to break through all of these boxes that we're put in because at the end of the day, we're talking about humanity, right? So it's just building muscles, start with something small, you know, like when you're followed in a store, you know, confront the person that's following you, uh, call for the manager and have the conversation, but then ask more questions. Um, that's how I've trained my kids to do. And I find that it's effective. And now, you know, in the workplace, my daughter, especially, she asks more questions to get people to kind of think about their behavior and take some perspective. And sometimes you have to put some space behind it and then follow it up in writing always document these kinds of things in an email of sort of how it made you feel using a lot of I statements when you want to address it. And I know a lot of good lawyers too, just FYI. So if something came out of it, I know a lot of good folks that, you know, could provide you some support too, um, if it got to that point. I mean, we hope that it never gets to that point, but in the United States of America, we legislate to regulate. That, that's what we do. Um, earlier, I showed this slide around the narratives that we have to adopt, right? Uh, and, and in this one is I've kind of intentionally did the strike through because this is the narratives under development. So in the previous two slides, I'm gonna go back. Um, the curator and the protector, right? Uh, this is the narrative for those two. But under, you know, when we're developing and we're moving ourselves, you know, down the continuum, this is kind of the, what we begin to adopt. Our worldview begins to change, right? Because we're working on ourselves. We see the system as a whole for what it is. We're not taking the bait that it's about the individual. We understand that we've all been socialized around internalized racial oppression, whether it's inferiority or superiority. We're recognizing how to name a thing. And when we see it, being able to frame it up that we see it, right? We've built muscle around it. So here's the new prompts, right? Uh, where they say, oh, it's the gate's broken or it won't open or close. Um, really the gate is being controlled by people, right? And it's who's ever closest to the gate at that time. Um, it's out of my control. Actually, I have agency, you know, and my agency is that I can choose to be silent with it or I can speak truth to power. Um, and also it's, you know, more than I was socialized to believe. I have more power than I was socialized to believe. I, I, I work in, you know, I'm getting ready to be 50. Yes, I'm a young grandmother, um, but that's because I was a young mother, right? Uh, but I, I feel every year of it. I said through lived experience, I'm getting ready to be 70. But as I think about when I was not clear about my personal power, I was afraid to lose a job. And then it happened one day. And that just like broke me open. One book that I recommend is Elizabeth Lesser's book called Broken Open. 
uh, because it's about you know confronting those fears and recognizing that we all have personal power. It's not what we've been socialized to believe in. And once we tap in, and it sounds cliche, Oprah has been talking about it, and we think she's saying that because she's got money in the bank to back it up, but it is around having your own personal power activated, right? So there are a lot of things that are out of our control, meaning other people you can't control, but how you show up how you advocate, that is all within your control. That is all within your control. When we say or hear, you know, the policy states, actually new policies are needed and there are exceptions to the old ones. I've seen those exceptions, right? I've seen those exceptions. Um, somebody has seen them as well, right? It's not just you. And it's really getting with the people who have the examples of those exceptions to challenge when they've made exceptions as an institution to those policies. And I'll give you a quick example is that um, a colleague of mine was trying to bring in a consultant and they were stonewalling around the threshold of the contract had to be this, that, and the other. They had to launch an RFP process, a request for a proposal. They had to do it competitively, blah, blah, blah. And then she inquired with the procurement officer and the procurement officer said, if it's under $250,000, we don't have to. And as a matter of fact, the person who's telling you this, their father came in and did some work for us and it wasn't competitive. And then gave examples of multiple, um, exceptions for the very people that we're trying to preserve, not bringing in a consultant around equity work. Okay, so the policy states there's always exceptions to that. Um, when we say, you know, this is above my pay grade or needed supervisor's approval, uh, that's when you should be ignited to say, you know, enough is enough. I'm ready to put skin in the game. I don't know if I told this story to my Wixap family, but when I was doing uh, some leadership training at the city of Seattle, I went outside for a break and it was the only day it snowed there. And it was a thin strip of snow on the stairs. And I was looking so cute. Y'all couldn't believe how cute. This was pre-COVID wait. I was looking so cute. And I fell down those stairs in these boots. I still went back and did the training, right? Because I'm committed. But let me tell you, I had missed three opportunities to use my voice. And when I fell down the stairs, it reminded me I needed to stand up for myself, right? I could advocate the world for anybody else, but I wasn't doing it for myself. And the universe was tired of it because I'm doing affirmations, but not advocating for myself. Um, and so I was ready to put skin in the game when that next opportunity came. What we resist persists, right? Um, when you hear it's always been this way, well, until now, today is a new day, right? We get to change that narrative. The data suggests, question the data source and the motive. What are we supposed to do it? Does this data reflect the voices and the lived experiences of all people or a sector of people? You know, they give us the methodology of how the data co was collected, but was it at a time where what we, his we know is BIPOC people are tend to be more hourly people. So they're at the bottom of the organization. And as a result, they don't have the flexibility to engage in data collection and surveys and things of that. We're working two and three jobs. So we just have to think about these kinds of things. Things. Um, I'm not in control of the gate. Really, I am, and I didn't realize it, right? And there's a famous little cliche, who left the gate open? I did, right? <laughs> I did, and I didn't know I did. You know, like, how did you get in? Who left the gate open? Uh, and that in itself is a powerful statement. Uh, goodwill for some, everyone is not deserving. Who decides that? If you're committed to equity, and this is what I find. If I say this enough to people, oh, well, tell me your commitment to equity. If you don't want to do um, a, a pledge that says we want to make sure that our workforce at minimum looks like the county that we're in, what you're saying is that I'm comfortable having it look like what it looks like. And are you comfortable putting that in writing, right? And I'll give you an example, like in the theater, it's like there's a demand letter where they say they wanted 50% of the season to be BIPOC artists, BIPOC shows, not just exploiting the pain of BIPOC, 
BIPOC people. Well, you've had a 40 year run of doing 10% BIPOC shows. So what you really were committed to was 90% white shows. And when you put that in perspective, people are uncomfortable acknowledging it. Well, here's the data. You like data, right? Here's your data, right? And so it's just about how we package it. Uh, but equity means we all deserve access because we all don't have bootstraps, right? And it's just how we frame the conversation. And when folks say in the name of protecting democracy, fiscal responsibility, or protection against fraud, fraud it's really preserving oppression and it's fear of the power shift. So Carol Anderson has a book. It started out as an article called White Rage. And one of the things that she says, and we saw it with Stacey Abrams, we, start, we saw it with the insurgents on January 6th, which is that we are socialized that people, are, it's a caste system in, in the United States, right? Is that you're supposed to be doing what, you know, this, where you belong. And we see many examples of where certain people are, are you're not supposed to be in a certain neighborhood, blah, blah, this, that, and the other. But when Kamala Harris, was elected to vice president with Joe Biden, people lost their mind. And when Stacey Abrams whipped those votes like she did going door to door, people lost their mind. And I'm not saying all people, I'm saying specifically those folks that are assigned white who bought into their socialization and never trusted uh, uh, enough to question it that this, uh, there's a power imbalance. And so now we have to react to this power, this power imbalance. So then you get pictures of people swinging from the Senate floor, sitting at Nancy Pelosi's desk, right? And then claiming temporary insanity. Actually, you planned this for months and then you had to drive from where you live to get to the Capitol. So you had time to think about it. So that's not temporary insanity. That's not in the heat of the moment. You thought this through. Right. That's my two cents on the nickel. I mean, that's how I woke up this morning. Uh, just FYI. Yeah, some people even flew. Some people even flew. And you had to go through those long TSA lines. So you had time to think about this, honey. You had time to think about it. So we're not going to give you a pass, but we are going to give you some of that accountability that you believe we all are supposed to be holding to. Um, Types of gatekeepers, okay? So with this new narrative that we lay, I just laid out here, there's the change agent, okay? Uh, intentionally disrupting um, or unconsciously demonstrating behavior that results in social, culture, or behavior change. I've had so many people in my career say to me that, you know, my ability to speak truth to power unapologetically inspired them to do it. And this is what I mean. This is why affinity groups are really important within organizations or employee resource groups, because folks are thinking it, people are having a side conversation, but they need support to come up. And it really strengthens the organization um, to, you know, inspire changes in practices. And sometimes you don't know how to do it and you don't have to do it perfect. You just have to be willing to do it. Um, the other thing is that, you know, a change agent usually uh, has an agenda. They don't have to set it themselves. That's the collaborative piece of it. Um, but they have this ability to influence um, change in others' perspectives. Um, and it's not about authority because keep in mind, authority gets you compliance. It doesn't get you commitment. I mean, compliance only goes so far. And when that leadership change, it defaults. You want influence relationships, not authoritarian relationships, because they're only with you while you have something, as Billie Holiday say, you know, um, ain't nobody's business if I do. Friends, they come around until you have no more money. They're not really friends, right? Uh, I grew up in New Orleans, so I listen to a lot of music, jazz, blues, what have you. Examples are seen of change agents in advocacy work. Um, and oftentimes they're prompted by some lived experience, right? A tragic death of a loved one um, prompts the person who didn't think they had a voice. I love Patty Murray's story. She was advocating for one of her children. They thought she would never be Senator. She was a tennis shoe mother, right? That she ran for and she went all the way. She went all the way. 
Now, all, what, what, all of her policies and what have you, I haven't followed you know, that closely with her. I'm just now paying attention to politics on that level. But I think that there's something valuable in her igniting her personal power. And we all have the ability to do it, but we've been socialized that we don't. Uh, the second type that I consider to be more of a positive one is the facilitator, right? This is another example of advocacy work um, or advocate. It's improving or maintaining internal processes to help the new gated to enter into the organization or have access. We don't want gated at all, number one, let me just say that. But in the, the, the construct that we're operating in, those gates are going to exist. We're not going to eradicate those gates in our lifetime. Just think if those gates have existed, you know, since 1619. So maybe in a thousand years from now, you know, there will be no gates, but we would have better information about um, leaving them open, right? Leaving them open, or we would have enough influence to say we don't need them anymore. But while we have them, the facilitator could buddy up and partner with helping folks navigate, acclimate to, you know, the important parts of the culture that don't require you to assimilate and give up your personal identity. And we are seeing that already with natural hair, right? It saddens me that we have to have legislation to wear hair the way it grows out of our hair, our head, but it's still progress nonetheless. And eventually we won't even need that, right? But we're seeing movement in the right directions. And this is the time that we've really kind of teased out moments from movements, right? We had many movements in the past that kind of died down. Um, and you know there were some diehards still there trying to push it forward. But now if anything comes out of what has happened with Mr. Floyd is that it really woke people up. And because of COVID, which has been a tragic and devastating thing for people who have lost loved ones, is that we were focused on TV. So we couldn't, we could no longer deny, we could no longer have the cognitive dissonance about race relations um, and what was really happening in America. And it piqued people's curiosity about, I should know more, I should do more. You know, and there's this really wonderful video of this lady, a uh, black lady standing at the front of this line and the cop didn't even think about taking his bike and pushing it to hit her, to knock her down. And there was her sister, this white lady who she didn't know, who jumped in and took the cop's bike and pushed it back and hit him with it. And I'm not advocating for violence, but what I'm saying is when she stood up, he didn't see a threat with this woman's skin and he dare not hit her, right? So it's just really interesting because he knew that he would be held accountable for that. When I talk about the historic, right, gatekeeping policies, I brought up just two that um, we can get into. I don't even know time check how much time we have, but I want to see if I could cover these for us. Uh, the National Labor Relations Act uh, aptly referred to as the Wagner Act of uh, 1935, and this was under uh, President Roosevelt. So this was supposed to be, you know, of course, folks, capitalism, factories or what have you uh, fought this tooth and nail, but it guarantees the rights of workers to organize and it began to outline the legal framework for collective bargaining. Um, but if you look closely at it, one of the things that they were fighting with was the South because they, were, they, they wanted to maintain their workforce. And what they felt is that, meaning kind of the lobbyists down there, this is post-slavery, it's 1935, post-depression, is that if you allow everybody to organize and join unions, then people are not going to want these low-wage paying jobs. Not that you should increase the wages, and provide a living wage. This is the debate we're still having now with the minimum wage, right? So again, this is not so far removed. This is the same argument, um, but people are now in position to change that and we're seeing it catch on. But to exclude the way they passed it was that the Wagner Act um, excludes independent contractors, 
um, domestic workers and farm workers. And this is saying race without saying race. So we have to be aware of dog whistle politics and be able to understand this language of legislation by not saying a thing, we say a thing. And we saw that with the crack epidemic of powdered cocaine versus crack cocaine, rocked up cocaine, it's still cocaine, right? We see it with how we address the opiate crisis because uh, who is falling victim to it? to the disease versus when it was crack and how families was decimated um, in the black and brown communities, right? So we begin to kind of think about these things in this way. And with the National Labor Relations Act, one of the things the argument was, and they tried to make it not about race, uh, but more about the socioeconomic condition, 60% of people holding domestic worker titles and farm workers were black and brown people. And they did not want to pay livable wages to folks. And so they excluded, and this was how they were able to pass the Wagner Act. And this is the National Labor Relations Act today. If you work in a, if you work in an environment represented by the union, that you have to, you know, you have standards in here to organize without inter interference and things like that. The second one is the Immigration Act of 1924. Now, this started out as we think about, they didn't want every type of white skinned person in America. So in 1924, right around the depression era, right? That it was designed to keep the undesirable ethnic groups out, right? They wanted to keep the Northern and Western European heritage come in, but not the Southern, not the East Europeans, right? From coming to America. And there was quotas, it's called the national uh, origins formula of two to 3% a year um, from their key geographical places uh, before, um, you know, in 1924. And it was expanded in 65 to abolish the national origin formula of how folks could come in, the percentage of folks to come in. It's still a hot mess, uh, immigration, number one, right? And you can now, you know, seek political asylum uh, from persecution, and there's so much violence going around the world. But what we've decided is that still, if you're brown, right, that you can't seek it. And we've come up with this nice governmental process that says that you have to follow this process before we can help you, when actually that's not what the law says. But see, we trust what we've been told. And throughout history, we have to pay attention that indigenous folks were told in treaties that they didn't even read the language, right? Now that they couldn't read, we gotta just you know say it wasn't in their native tongue. So we just think about social dominance and how we're expected to learn and conform to what's Eurocentric versus the inclusivity of making things, you know, just like we have ASL here today, we have closed caption, right? We wanna make sure that it's inclusive for everybody. That wasn't happening in 1924, 65, 75, 85, 95, right? It's like, we're getting a clue now of how we've kept information and gatekeeping and not even knowing or even having it in braille, right? Like, this is the thing that we're thinking about. Like, one thing that there are a few Starbucks that have the camera now, so because they were thinking about the hearing impaired. But it's not everyone, but it's a step. But it's nice when they implement for all, because then they make assumptions that people are planning the drive through, right? And I'm not going to say, as Louis, uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan, like, we're not winning. This is long overdue. This is long overdue. It's a step in the right direction and we can do more. Uh, this last piece, uh, before I get into that, let me go back here. Okay. Okay, thanks for the time check, Michelle. That probably was 10 minutes ago, huh? <laughs> um, and the $300 unemployment. Okay. So let me, I'm gonna wrap up this piece here. Uh, and it, this was just an example of when I'm analyzing something, I like to think about it in terms of this. And I ask myself a couple of questions. 
would the criteria be the same and would we be motivated to action differently? And I can think of a few different things. I've thrown out some of the real life examples. Um, the Flint water crisis um, is one. Um, would we have as a society responded very differently? Um, if there were white skinned children in cages with blue eyes, brown eyes, what have you, uh, Jane Elliott's experiment, would we act and respond in the same way? And so I put together these scenarios saying, okay, what if the gates are open 60% of the time is one statement. Um, and what are, if the gates are closed 60% of the time? What if it was white, white communities versus um, or uh, BIPOC communities. And I don't wanna say versus because for this activity as I'm doing analysis, I combined uh, these statements here, which are kind of, we took uh, statement number one and we paired it with this here. And then we took statement number one, paired it over there and vice versa. Statement number three with two and statement number three with four. And I'm gonna show you what it looks like here, which is that statements one and two. So here's some plausible scenarios. If the gates are open 60% of the time for white communities, they have a lot of opportunities because in this, remember there's still classism because we're a capitalistic society. So we have to think about that uh, because once you can get through you know, the classism or you, you know, get a certain amount of money, you're still tethered to this race, right? It's the dominant thing. That's why we always lead with race in this work. Um, if we take statements three and two, the gates are closed 60% of the time for white communities, we would have a different call to action. Remember that little girl who talked about gun control and became really famous? You know, black kids and mothers have been crying for how long around gun violence? And then the narrative is that, well, y'all are killing each other because the NRA, right, is doing their advocacy. Let's just think about it. They're holding the gate. So we just think about it. Um, statements three and four, if gates are closed 60% of the time for BIPOC, what conditions are created? It's the ones that we see. And again, remember access to information, uh, resources, opportunity. We did not create redlining in our communities. We didn't, re we didn't create the narrative around inferiority. We were assigned that and then we passed it down because of being knocked down. So that's why we have to do that internal work and recognize that we've been bamboozled to quote Malcolm X. And then statement four, um, gates are open 60% of the time for BIPOC communities. What would happen if we see this? And what I'm saying is that we're living at a point in time in history right now where those gates are nearing 60%. It's not 60% that everything is, you know, kumbaya. It's 60% mass, as um, Malcolm Gladwell is talking about the tipping point. Because when George Floyd was publicly executed, you saw brothers and sisters come together around the world, <laughs> China, France, right? To put pressure that this has to stop. This has to stop, right? And so, and this is what's happening. BIPOC communities and folks that are not BIPOC people, but that are our sisters and brothers are standing with us, like the woman in the bike saying, I'm not gonna stay silent. No, not at all, right? I'm gonna come from the heart of humanity. And this is what needs to happen. I'm gonna do this work. I'm gonna invest for my organization in this work. Consultants have never been so busy. Let me just tell you that. Never been so busy. And so when we think about that, you know, we start putting these scenarios together and begin to ask ourselves questions about the gates we keep. Um, and we get curious about information that we're being fed. You know, one thing I would lead you with is, you know, examine um, how you've been socialized to keep these gates closed, whether it's by policy, onboarding to a new job, where people are feeding you limitation. Don't trust it. Because there, you know, there is no limitation in the universe. You know, it's it's just it's not. That's I'm big on vision boards, and I have to say, every vision board um, has come true for me with what I've put together. And then, you know, as you're leaving the session today, too, make a commitment to what gates um, you will open. You know, for other people.
okay? And I always go back to, you know, when I do kind of trainings and capacity sessions, you know, it's that my commit was to commitment was to provide a foundational understanding of gatekeeping, the process and mechanism. Um, and in many ways, the machine works to secure those gated in and gated out of opportunity. And when we're asking these questions of ourselves, we need to do our work and we have to check ourselves and be accountable and allow others to hold us accountable and keep asking questions, keep building relationships because you can't do it by yourself. And that's where we get exhausted. Thank you so much, Yi. Ooh. Amazing in a short period of time, I know. It's a lot, but as Yi said, this is foundational um, information and you can use this to springboard onto the different, dig deeper with your teams, with everybody you know, <laughs> dig deeper and we can each do better, right? And I'm including myself in that. It's personal. This is personal work and um, it starts with us. Thank you again, Don Yida, for being a keynote speaker in our series 2021. Don Yida has put in her um, email into the chat for you all. As I said, we've been, Wixap has been working with her since uh, June of 2020. It's been, it's been a very um, life-changing experience for the better and we're growing. And it's, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's heart, H-E-A-R-T work and it's difficult, hard, H-A-R-D work. Ye has uh, witnessed us crying many, many times and angry many, many times. So. I'm so glad we were able to bring her to this platform and she could meet all of you. Thank you so much. And remember, there are more keynote series coming up. Um, we have six more sessions, I believe. Uh, it's all on our website. So thank you all for being here. It's 1036. Not bad, Yi. Not bad. Not getting over too far. <laughs> I was trying to speed through it. <laughs> you did great, as usual. Thank you. And it's Thank recorded you. so you, we can everyone. go back. It's recorded so we can go back and yeah. watch it. Mm -hmm. And we have the PowerPoint too. So um, to share that out if folks want the PowerPoint. This was uh, developed specifically for this keynote series. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Yi. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So hopefully you got something from it. Um, again, just think, and now, you know, I would just say that it is scary doing the right thing, but you do it anyway. You're building muscle around it and you'd be surprised how many people stand with you. Advocates, it's not the one you think will show up. It'll be someone else that you didn't expect that was thinking and waiting for you to show up so that they could stand with someone because they didn't want to do it by themselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 